Um, my name is uh, Dr. Vanessa Meyer Stevenson. I'm of uh, the University of Calgary and Lethbridge. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be one of the postdoctoral trainees for, through the Can Hep C program. And my co-chair for this morning is Dr. Rod Russell from the University uh, uh, from Memorial University, in Newfoundland. Um, so the way that um, the uh, the session is arranged is we're going to have one of our other trainees introduce the first speaker, the first two speakers. So can I call up Louis Liu to introduce Dr. Ralph Bartenschlager? Morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Ralph Bautenschlager, who is from the University of Heidelberg in Germany. His lab focuses on understanding how hepatitis C and B viruses establish persistence in host cells, as well as understanding how host cell factors are exploited by these factors, by these viruses, to facilitate efficient replication. Together, these studies act as the basis for the development of novel antiviral strategies with a focus on host cell dependency factors that can be used for the development of broad spectrum antiviral drugs. So if you join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Ralph Bartenschlager. And just as a quick note, we're gonna hold questions to the end of the first two speakers. So think of, think of your questions and then we'll, uh, we'll have a uh, question and answer session just after. So first of all, I would like to thank you for coming here so early in the morning uh, to listen to something which I have to admit is not really translational. I think it's still interesting to look into some of the more fundamental aspects of HCV. And those of you who have been here yesterday have already heard some of our research ongoing in the field of virus host interaction, viral replication and so on. And what I would like to do today is to focus a little bit more on some immune aspects, although I have to say I'm not a T-cell or any kind of adaptive immunologist, so I take the immunology light, which is essentially innate immunity and signaling, and more, more or less it's interferon. So um, when you take a look at the, at, the, at the immune response as it happens in an HCV individual infected individual, roughly 30% of the infections have an acute self-limiting course. And this follows a classical case. So you have a, a, an increase in viremia followed by the activation of a type one, type three interference signature. Then a T-cell response kicks in and starts to control the virus. This is then followed or concomitant with an interferon gamma response. And then those patients who are able to eliminate the virus, they have a T cell response that ultimately clears the infection. However, in the majority of cases, uh, the T cell response for unknown reasons starts to contract, and this is normally a prelude to persistence. The T cell responses go away. Uh, the T cells develop an exhausted phenotypes, and the virus keeps then uh, an intermediate or high or low level viremia. And interestingly, there's a constant activation of the interferon system. So that means that the virus can replicate in the face of an activated interferon response. So that, of course, raises a lot of, let's say, fundamental basis basic questions. Some of them I've listed just here. So how can the virus persist while the interference system is activated? Um, how is the virus actually sensed in the cells? What is the sensor, the pattern recognition receptor? Is there a role for TLR3? How does H3 drive T cell exhaustion? And there will be presentations during this meeting on that. Why is HCV so successful to overcome uh, uh, the immune response? Because 70% of infections become chronic. And last but not least, that's an evolutionary aspect. Where does HCV come from? And not only HCV, but you know, there are also other hepatitis viruses. So, so what is the evolutionary origin and how did they adapt so well to the, to the human host? And I would like to mention that most of these questions have been studied within a research network, which is called Transregio 179, which has entered into a collaboration with CanHEP-C, which allows to exchange students from Heidelberg to, or from this Transregio to Canada and vice versa as students from Canada visiting our labs here within the Transregio. Now, when you look in, into the literature, you will find one of the landmark papers from Frank Cesari's lab where, where he studied essentially the interference response upon infection with HCV. And these are three experimental, experimentally inoculated chimpanzees. And you can see pretty much in all these cases, uh, the interference stimulated genes, the ISGs are upregulated, no matter whether the chimp was able to clear the infection or develop the persistence. So that clearly shows 
Obviously, the virus induces an interferon response, but in some in uh, in case of persistence, essentially it can overcome that. So, how does the system work? Just a quick reminder: the virus is entering the cell, then the viral RNA genome is released, and then it can be sensed by pattern recognition receptors, RIG I. Um, um, MDA5 and there's also LGP2. Then this uh, induces a signal via an adapter protein, which is called MAFS, which sits mostly at the mitochondria, but also at peroxisomes and the ER. And this then activates a signaling cascades to produce the interference. Type 1 and type 3 interference, so beta and lambda, they are released from the infected cell and then they bind to the same cell or neighboring cells to the interferon receptors, which then triggers the check stat signaling cascade and then is driving the expression of roughly four to five hundred genes that in total confer the antiviral state. And when you treat cells with interferon and then try to infect with HCV, the cells are pretty much resistant. So it's a really very powerful system that can control the virus. And for that reason, the viruses have developed antiviral strategies. And one of them, which is well studied in the case of HCV, is a protease. So the virus has a protease called NS34A. And this protease cleaves off the MAFS protein and thereby is blocking the signaling cascade. And that's why the cells have, let's say, kind of a dampened interferon response. So the questions we were interested in was, where, what is the relevance of this MAFS cleavage for HCV replication? Does it actually control the MAFS no matter where it's uh, located subcellularly? Who is actually sensing the virus and what is the role of this LGP2 protein? And to do so, we generated cell lines which are highly susceptible to HCV infection. And we were knocking out the MAFS gene, so that means these cells are unable to mount an interferon response. And then we put the, uh, the, the MAFS gene back, either as a normal wild-type MAF, so that's a typical reconstitution, or we put back MAFs which are exclusively expressed at the peroxisomes or at the mitochondria. And as a control, we also introduced a MAFS gene where the cleavage site for the protease has been inactivated. So that means this, this cell is now um, no longer controlled by HCV because the virus cannot cleave the MAFS in these cells. So we then looked for the subcellular localization of these MAFS proteins. I don't go into the details. Overall, the subcellular localization was correct. So PEX MAF is per oxisomes. Mitomafs is at mitochondria and the wild type MAFs is in fact at both sides. So then we were infecting these cells with a reporter with a model virus, which is called Sendai, which is a potent inducer of the interferon response. And you can see when the cells do not express MAFs, MAFs KO cells, there is nothing happening. They are interferon incompetent. But when you replenish again with different versions of the MAF gene, the interferon response comes back, no matter where the MAF protein localized, be it at the peroxisome or at the mitochondria, and also the cleavage-resistant MAFs is fully functional. And we then challenge these cells with HCV. And when you just look at this part of the blot, you can see when, H when the cells are infected in those uh, cells which have a cleavable MAFs, the MAFS protein is indeed proteolytically cleaved, both at the peroxisome and at the mitochondria, whereas with the cleavage-resistant MAFS, the virus cannot interfere anymore. And to cut the long story short, in fact, in those cells where MAFS is cleavage-resistant, HCV is inducing an interferon response measured here by looking at the levels of interferon-stimulated genes or by looking at the levels of interferon protein that is released into the culture supernatant. So that means HCV indeed is quite efficiently in controlling the signaling cascade via proteolytic cleavage of MAFs. And in fact, it doesn't matter where the protein is, the virus is always able to control this infection. So we were also interested in another pattern recognition receptor, which is called LGP2. Now this LGP2 is quite interesting because although it also is an RNA binding protein, it is unable to transmit a signal to MAFs because it does not have the domain to bind to the MAFs protein. So the question is, what is this protein actually doing? And for that purpose, we generated again cell lines 
which have these cleavage resistant valves and either express no, low or high levels of LGP2. And again, we were then challenging the cells with HCV infection. And if you just look down here, for instance, in cells that do not have uh, an, an interferon, the MAFS KO cells at every time point, this is the black bar, there is no response. When the MAFS cleavage resistance variant is present in the cell, this is the orange bars, there is an activation. However, this response is very much potentiated by the presence of LGP2. So LGP2 is actually boosting very much the interferon response. So the last point to that was then, who is actually sensing the virus? Is it Rig I or is it MDA5? And what you normally do is just a so-called knockdown. That means you take these cells and you knock down either Rig I or MDA5 in all these different cells. This is just the control for the knockdown efficiency for Rig I and MDA5. And the more important uh, graph is shown up here. So in the cells which have only seen control as iRNA. There is without MAF ob MAFs obviously nothing. With, uh, without LGP2, there is an interferon response, but again, depending in a dose dependent manner, LGP2 very much potentiates the interferon response. When we knock down Rig I, there is little effect. However, when we knock down MDA5, the interferon response is gone. So that means that HCV is predominantly sensed by MDA5 and not by Rig I, what you often can read in the literature, and this uh, response is very much enhanced by LGP2, and for time reason I cannot show you, this antiviral response, this interferon response, is very much suppressing HCV replication. So I would like to mention HCV is not the only one, the only hepatitis virus that is sensed in that way in collaboration with Stefan Urban within our Transregio, we could show that also hepatitis D virus, which is a satellite of HPV, is also sensed by MDA5. In fact, HDV, like HCV, is a very potent inducer of the interferon response, and this is very predominantly uh, sensed by MT MDA5, and again, this response is also very much potentiated by LGP2. So following a pretty similar pathway as we have seen for HCV, however, there's an important difference. Delta virus or HDV is pretty much insensitive to the interferon, no matter whether it's the endogenously induced interferon or whether it's in interferon that is given from the outside. So I think it's really nice to compare also these hepatitis virus to learn how different or how dissimilar they are. Now the last aspect to the innate immunity now relates to the question, is there a role of toll-like receptor 3 also for HCV? Now for that I would like to briefly remind you of the replication cycle. So this is the HCV particle, it enters the cell and then the RNA genome is replicated in a membrane structure which is called the membranous web. And this membranous web is an accumulation of so-called double membrane vesicles. And obviously these double membrane vesicles have a certain turnover. They are not made and stay there forever, they also are removed. And the way they are removed is probably via the release of exosomes or extracellular vesicles. And um, already in 2001, when we had the first uh, replication system for HCV, we realized these cells, no matter whether they have the full genome or a subgenome, they do release viral RNA in membrane-protected vesicles. And the way this works, as we know now, is these double membrane vesicles from the membranous web are probably going to the multivesicular body and then are released out of the cell. Now the interesting point is the multivesicular body, they communicate to lysosomes and thereby the MVB can get access to toll-like receptor 3. So that means here we would have a structure where HCV RNA in principle could be sensed by TLR3 because TLR3 is present within such vesicles and not, like in not as in contrast to Rig I and MDA5 in the cytoplasm. So we then asked, is HCV really sensed by TLR3 and what is the relevance of these exosomes as they are released out of the cell? Why does the virus do that? And to do that, we again generated cell lines which either express Rig I or MDA5 or TLR3 and then we were testing these cells 
by either transfecting in a double-stranded RNA mimic, which is called PolyIC, which is a very common activator of the response. And you can see when you transfect it in, cells that have RIG-I or MDA5 or TLA3, shown these grain bars, gray bars, they respond quite well. However, when you add PolyIC just into the supernatant, only the cells that have TLA3 respond because this PolyIC is taken up by vesicular into uh, by endocytosis and these vesicles then enter in the lysosomes where they can be sensed by by TLR3 and this response is pretty much similar to what we see in primary human hepatocytes which also express rig i mda5 and TLR3 so then the question was what happens when you now take the cells and and measure hcv replication by using such an a mini genome which is called replicon which has a simple reporter so what you take, you take the cells that express either RIG-I, MDA5, or TLA3, you put in this RNA, and then you measure RNA replication simply by measuring the reporter gene activity. And the higher the activity, the higher the replication. And what you can see in cells where TLR3 is present, HCV replication is about reduced tenfold as compared to the cells that do have RIG-I or MDA5, indicating that TLR3 is somehow suppressing virus replication. And this is mirror imaged by the activation of the interferon response in cells where we have TLR3. The interferon response measured here is way higher as compared to cells which have RIG-I or MDA5. So what does that mean? It means that RIG-I and MDA5 responses are well controlled by HCV, and this is what you would expect because these molecules signal via MAFs, and as I told you, MAFs is efficiently cleaved by the virus, viral protease, whereas TLR3 uh, is poorly controlled by HCV because this is not signaling via MAFs, but via another molecule, which is called TRIF. And it also means that TLR3, in fact, can be activated by HCV replication. And this happens within the cell and not via vesicles that are taken up by other cells and therefore activate the TLR3. So then the question was, what happens when we now block the secretion of these vesicles? And this you can do by doing a knockdown or by adding a drug which blocks the exosome, uh, product, uh, exosome production and the exosome release. And we did that, and we used again the cell lines. So this is, uh, uh, these are the control cells which do not or do express TLR3. Again, in the presence of TLR3, replication is lower. When we now block the exosome release in cells without TLR3, nothing happens. However, when we block the exosome release in, in cells with TLR3, we do see that HCV replication is even more suppressed as compared to cells that do release the exosomes. And again, when we measure then the interferon response, we see that in those cells where we block the exosome release, the interferon response is roughly tenfold higher induced as compared to normal cells. So what can we conclude from that? That means that obviously HCV is releasing its double-strand RNA intermediates via exosomal release and thereby is bypassing the activation of toll-like receptor 3. And this really happens within the infected cells and not by an uptake of PDCs or other immune cells to activate this response. So this is, I would say, a really interesting and a novel concept how a virus is overcoming the recognition by toll-like receptor 3. Now, so far I have told you that HCV is really a potent inducer of the interferon response. Now, although this is a meeting on HCV, I would like to elaborate a little bit beyond the horizon and raise the question to the comparison to have hepatitis B virus, which has been called a stealth virus, flying under the radar as uh, Stefan Wieland and Frank Cesari have coined the term, because when they infected chimpanzees with hepatitis B virus. The virus was replicating quite robustly, <clears throat> but when they were looking for interferon responses, in fact, there was just nothing. So that raises the question, is the virus simply flying under the radar or is it potently suppressing virus replication? And I don't want to go into the detail, but the bottom line is HPV is really a stealth virus flying under the radar. <clears throat> So HPV is entering the cell in a way that its uh, genome, the so-called CCC DNA, is deposited in the nucleus. And this happens pretty much unrecognized by the cell. So it's a very efficient stealth virus. 
and then um, the viral uh, the virus is replicating and when you are then adding interferon from the outside it has a really moderate effect on HC HPV replication in contrast HCV is efficiently sensed by the interferon system produces interferon and these interferon stimulated genes are potently blocking HCV replication and pretty much the same happens when you add interferon from the outside so this is really a virus that has been called, this is a stealth virus and H HCV is a cunning virus. And the question then for us was, what makes HPV so efficient to escape the immune response? And we think part of the answer is, it's a long-term co-evolution with humans. In fact, since the beginning of humans, HPV was around. And we ended into this question by, by a completely different uh, uh, approach, where we simply asked the question, why, how can a, a virus genome that is so compact like HPV ever be developed by nature? Because pretty much every reading frame is overlap. So when you take the information content and pull it out into a linear sequence, it is, has an information content as a retrovirus. So you can regard HPV like a zip file of a retrovirus. And the question is, how does nature make this? And the hypothesis of Stefan Seitz in the lab was that the hepatina virus to which HPV belongs have developed from an ancestor where there was no envelope gene around and the envelope gene was acquired by an insertion into the open reading frame of the polymerase. So that was the original assumption. And what Stefan then did, he was digging into sequence archives and what he then found were indeed viruses that fulfilled these criteria. They have pretty much the same architecture like HPV, but they are lacking the envelope gene. And these viruses have been called Naketna virus because they are non-enveloped. That means naked viruses. And um, we then resurrected the genomes and were producing nucleocapsids. And this is a cryo-EM structure. And the structure of the, of the capsid monomer and dimer is virtually identical. Um, but there's a difference, T equal 4 versus T equal 3 symmetry. So that means these non-enveloped capsids are much more tight. They are really sealing the genome. We could also show they are replicating in the cells. They make only naked capsids. They replicate by a reverse transcription in a protein prime mechanism. And last but not least, uh, by using bioinformatics approaches, it turned out that HPV uh, has developed more or less along with the human host and we could trace it back to roughly 430 million years ago with the evolution of uh, animals on land. And this pre-SS gene most likely was acquired by an insertion event. And it's interesting to note that while the hepatina virus are specifically adapted to the liver, these fish viruses are not, probably because the envelope has meant an, a, a speciation to develop in the in the, in the liver. And the last question to that is now, what about the other viruses, Hep C, Hep D, A, and E? And for Hep C, we are working on that, but this is my last slide. Um, for Hepatitis D, which is, a, as I already mentioned, a satellite of Hepatitis B, um, it was found that this, it was thought for a long time that this virus has evolved as in a close connection with the humans because this was the only vir human virus that was, and the only virus that was known of this kind, although such, uh, such RNA virus are present very abundantly in plants. Now, very recently, two groups have found such Delta viruses, as they are called, in other species, like ducks and snakes. And in fact, especially the study by Hetzel and co-workers could show these viruses are really replicating in these animals because they have antibodies, they can express, they produce antigen and so on and so forth. And the interesting point is there, these viruses do not have a helper like HDV virus for HPV. And the question is, how could this be? And the answer is there was a very recent publication showing that probably other viruses can envelope these particles. And it was thought that HPV, HDV, DV requires always HPV for the envelopment, but in fact, it's possible that also HCV can envelope HDV particles. So this is a really a remarkable observation, which of course, I would say revolutionizes our thinking about where HDV comes from. So I hope I could convince you that working with hepatitis virus is interesting. These are not 
boring agents. And with this, I would like to thank the people in the lab, especially Pascal, Nadine, and Stefan, who did all the work. And I would like to mention my collaborators here within the Transregio, especially also Chris Lauber, our bioinformatician, who is really a genius in making search algorithms. Thank you.